Welcome to Cleaver Fulton Rankin's inaugural Employment Law Podcast. Um, my name is Ashling Byrne, an Associate Director in the Employment Department, and today we're just going to focus on some recent developments in discrimination case law and look at a couple of decisions from England and Wales over the last year that may be of relevance to your business. The first case is a case on harassment on the grounds of disability and race and it's a case that was reported widely in the media in the case of Evans versus Exactly and it's an Employment Appeals Tribunal decision um, from October 2018. Now the newspaper headlines were fairly shocking in that the claimant in the case had been called a fat ginger pikey by a colleague um, and the background to the case was that the claimant that was a diabetic and he also had strong links with the traveling community and Mr Evans was dismissed on the grounds of performance but claimed that comments that had been made to him uh, constituted harassment on the grounds of race and or disability. Amongst the other comments that had been made about him were salad dodger, uh, fat yoga and Gimli a reference to uh, a character in Lord of the Rings so not particularly nice comments uh, made by colleagues and on the face of it it certainly seemed as though Mr Evans had been subjected to comments that constituted harassment um, and the Employment Appeals Tribunal in looking at, at that said yes the comment fat ginger pikey was potentially discriminatory but that it was necessary to look at the comment in context. The EAT found that in reality Mr Evans was actually an active participant in inappropriate comments and behaviour in the workplace um, and was comfortable uh, in the work environment and so the office culture was found to be one of jiving and teasing and Mr Evans himself mocked a female member of staff's weight by calling her uh, a pudding and also called one of his other colleagues a fat paddy on a regular basis and so it was clear to the Employment Appeals Tribunal that he was actually an active participant um, in, the, in the culture of banter within the workplace. So the upshot was that the EAT concluded that the comments made to Mr Evans were not unwanted because he was actually an active participant in the culture of banter and the comments therefore didn't have the purpose of violating his dignity or creating an intimidating environment. Um, this case does however come with a word of caution um, it's not sensible to have a culture of workplace banter um, and it seems as though the employer in this case succeeded in defending the case um, because Mr Evans appeared to have given as good as he got in the workplace and there'll be many situations within the workplace where that actually won't be the case and so whilst it's helpful to have a decision um, that looks at, at context um, it's also employers need to be careful uh, that they don't over rely on this decision. So the next case that we're going to look at um, was an interesting decision and that is uh, again an Employment Appeals Tribunal decision from the UK EAT um, and that's a 2018 case and the case is Bacali versus Greater Manchester Buses uh, Limited. Um, the claimant in this case, Mr. Bacali, had worked for the company since 2008, uh, so he had quite lengthy employment uh, with Greater Manchester Buses. Um, and by way of background, he identified as a Muslim um, and he was of Moroccan uh, origin. And he made comments about a news article in which a journalist had in turn commented that uh, Islamic State fighters were good fighters. Um, and so the comments could be construed as being favourable to Islamic State, um, that is IS. Um, a colleague then subsequently asked him in the canteen if he was promoting IS uh, and the claimant by all accounts reacted badly to this. And although the colleague apologised, uh, the claimant started a fight and was ultimately dismissed uh, for misconduct. The claimant then in turn brought claims of discrimination and harassment um, and he argued that the comments uh, that his colleague had made to him about IAS constituted harassment. Uh, the Employment Appeals Tribunal however disagreed 
um, and they dismissed the claimant's appeal against the original uh, tribunal's decision. Um, and they held that the comment that was made to the claimant by his colleague was not harassment, again, when viewed in context. And it's interesting, this is another uh, decision from the Employment Appeals Tribunal that focuses on the context in which uh, comments are made, um, a bit like the exactly case that I've just spoken about. Um, and it's interesting in that comments that are made in isolation, uh, while that might on the face of it appear to be discriminatory, well, when it's actually put into context, um, it could actually be not the case. Um, another case, uh, this case involved a claim of discrimination on the grounds of religious belief and political opinion. And it's an interesting decision. Um, it's a case of Gray versus Mulberry. Um, and that is a decision that was issued in July 2018. Uh, the claimant in this case worked for the luxury goods brand Mulberry and she was a marketing support assistant. Um, and when she started employment at Mulberry, she was asked to sign a standard contract which included a clause that required her to sign, assign her IP rights to Mulberry in relation to anything that she created during the course of her employment. Uh, she wasn't happy about this um, because uh, she did some work in her own right as a writer and filmmaker outside working hours. Um, Mulberry then in turn made it clear to her that they had no particular interest in what she did outside working hours. What they were concerned with was IP created during the course of employment with them during working hours. Um, and they then caveated uh, the IP assignment um, so that that was made abundantly clear. However, the claimant still refused to sign um, the contract um, and eight months after starting work for Mulberry, she was actually dismissed. Um, she brought a claim to the tribunal for discrimination um, and because she didn't have the requisite service to bring an unfair dismissal uh, claim, um, she uh, argued uh, that the discrimination was direct and indirect on the grounds of belief. And the belief that she relied on was the belief in the sanctity of copyright and that people should own and profit from their own work. Um, she did concede that the beliefs that she held were private and that she hadn't raised them in her discussions with Mulberry about the particular clause. The tribunal that initially heard her claim dismissed the claim and held that Mulberry's actions were a proportionate means of safeguarding its intellectual property and that her belief was not eligible for protection. She then in turn appealed that decision and it went to, to the Employment Appeals Tribunal in England and the EAT held that her belief lacked sufficient cogency to qualify uh, for the protections under the Equality Act. Now we don't have the Equality Act 2010 in Northern Ireland but we do have uh, similar protections against discrimination on the grounds of religious belief and political opinion in Northern Ireland um, and that's in the form of the Fair Employment and Treatment Northern Ireland Order of 1998 and the EAT held that having a belief related, relating to an important aspect of human life or behaviour is not enough in itself um, for it to have a similar status uh, to a religious belief and the EAT went on to hold that there was no direct discrimination as a sole adherent to the philosophical belief was the claimant um, and therefore she couldn't establish um, any group disadvantage uh, for her claim of indirect discrimination. Uh, so that's an interesting case, um, a creative uh, way of using the protections under the Equality Act, um, but it was ultimately unsuccessful. The next case um, we're going to look at is a case involving sexual orientation discrimination um, and it's a case of McMahon versus Redwood, a fairly recent decision in that it's a decision from an English tribunal from January 2019. Um, the claimant was held to have been discriminated against on the grounds of her sexual orientation. And by way of background, the claimant in this case, Ashley McMahon, was a quality control manager at Redwood um, which is a Lancashire based textiles firm and she disclosed that she was gay to her boss 
uh, during the first week of her new job. Now her boss told her that she should keep quiet about this because the owner was old school um, and she worked for the company from May 2017 until she was made redundant in December 2017 um, and she said that the request to keep her sexual orientation quiet made her feel odd and uncomfortable um, but that she didn't disclose her sexual orientation to anyone else within the company as she was concerned about the repercussions for her. Um, she argued that her sexuality came up at least twice during her employment um, the first time was in relation to a dispute um, about a radio in the office um, when she was told by her boss to remove it, even though other members of staff were allowed to retain and listen to the radio. Um, she challenged him on this and she asked if she was being made, um, she, if she was being treated differently and denied the radio because she was gay, uh, which her boss denied. Um, the second allegation um, was that when she told her boss that she wasn't going to be attending the Christmas party as she felt uncomfortable that she couldn't disclose her sexuality. Um, she was told by him that she would have to pay for her ticket as uh, the numbers had actually been confirmed to the hotel. Um, and she brought claims alleging that her dismissal was on the grounds of her sexual orientation. Again, she didn't have the requisite service to bring an unfair dismissal claim. And so she argued that uh, she had been discriminated against. Um, the employment tribunal held that her sexuality had not been relevant to either the radio or the Christmas parties uh, issues that she'd raised, but they held that she had been directly discriminated against in relation to, to the request to keep her sexuality quiet. And the tribunal looking at uh, this found that a hypothetical comparator who was not gay would not have been asked to keep their sexuality a secret. And this case reinforces um, the fact that it's very important for an employer to have an equal opportunities policy in place, uh, but also to be very clear um, in relation to how it manages staff um, and that it shouldn't be making any distinction between employees on the basis of their sexual orientation. The next case uh, relates to shared parental leave um, and the take up for shared parental leave has been very low, um, but it is a right available to parents um, to allow them to care for uh, their children. Um, and this is a case of Tapita and Ali, um, a case from 2018, which went all the way to the Employment Appeals Tribunal, again, an English case. Um, this case was brought because Mr. Ali um, took two weeks of paternity leave following the birth um, of his baby and his wife then by way of background was unwell uh, with postnatal depression and she was advised uh, medically that it would be more beneficial for her to return to work. So Mr Ali asked if he could take shared parental leave so that he could care for the baby um, and he argued that because female employees in Capita um, were entitled to 14 weeks of full pay uh, in terms of maternity pay, that he should be entitled to the same treatment uh, when taking shared parental leave. Capita refused his request. Mr Ali raised a grievance alleging sex discrimination and when the grievance was not upheld, he then brought a tribunal claim um, alleging uh, discrimination. His main argument was that it was direct discrimination to provide full pay to mothers on maternity leave, but not fathers on shared parental leave. Um, but the tribunal looking at this, uh, the EAT decided uh, that the um, Mr. Raleigh couldn't compare himself with a woman on maternity leave, um, as there was a different purpose uh, between maternity leave and shared parental leave. Um, the purpose behind maternity leave, the EAT held, was to allow the mother to recover and it was for her health and well-being, whereas the purpose behind shared parental leave is to care for the child. Now, the origins uh, for this come from the EU Pregnancy Workers Directive, which requires member states to introduce legislation to enable a woman to take maternity leave with adequate pay for a minimum of 14 weeks. Um, and it's clear from the directive that the purpose of maternity leave and the pay associated with, with it uh, is for the health of the mother and not to look after the child. 
And so that was relied on um, by the EAT in this case um, to reach a conclusion um, that Mr. Ali had not been discriminated against. Uh, some commentators have argued that this is a strange decision, um, and certainly many people would disagree that the purpose behind maternity leave is for the health and well-being of the mother. Um, and when you think about it, given that there are only two weeks compulsory maternity leave, um, it could, whilst it could be argued that the two-week compulsory leave period is for the, for the health and well-being of the mother, anything beyond that is really for the purpose of looking after the baby. Uh, there's a case, a decision expected in a case of Hextel uh, versus Chief Constable of, of Leicestershire Police. And this is a case with very similar factual circumstances to the Alley case. Um, and so a decision is awaited from the EAT and it'll be interesting to see uh, whether there's any departure uh, from the Ali uh, decision, as I know a lot of uh, commentators disagree with the decision. Next case is the case of Lee and Asher's Baking Company Limited. Um, and this is a Supreme Court decision uh, from 2018. And I suppose it would be impossible to have a discrimination law update without mentioning the Asher's case um, because it has been so widely publicised in the media. It's been ongoing now for a number of years um, and it's gone from the County Court in Northern Ireland to the Court of Appeal um, and finally to the Supreme Court um, which sat in Belfast. Um, the decision of the, the Northern Ireland Court of Appeal was overturned at Supreme Court level um, and the Supreme Court held that Asher's didn't discriminate against a gay man when it refused on the grounds of the owner's religious belief to bake a cake with a photo of uh, Ernie and Bert from Sesame Street and the wording support gay marriage. The crux of the Supreme Court decision um, seems to be that um, it was the message and not the messenger and so um, the bakery had not refused to fulfil the order because of any personal characteristics of Mr Lee, who was gay, um, or anyone with whom he was associated. But rather, the decision not to bake the cake um, was because the owners of the bakery um, disagreed with the message on the cake. And the Supreme Court looked at uh, freedoms relating to religious, religious belief um, and uh, expression protected under the European Convention uh, on human rights under Articles 9 and 10. And the Supreme Court held that the freedoms included a right not to be obliged to manifest a belief uh, which you don't hold. And the court held that an infringement of those rights could not be justified by an obligation to supply a cake iced with a message with which the bakers profoundly um, disagreed. And so that um, is the conclusion of the Asher saga, which has been ongoing um, now for a number of years um, and is it useful to have a Supreme Court decision um, on this issue. So that's the end of uh, our uh, discrimination law update. Um, if anyone has any queries in relation to any of the cases or any general discrimination law queries, please feel free to uh, contact me. Um, my email address a.burn at cfrlaw.co.uk or give me a call anytime. Thank you for listening.